Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up with fine books sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Well, sadly, summer 2024 is nearing an end. However, an exciting finish to the baseball season is coming up, and NFL training camps and preseason games are grabbing sports headlines everywhere. With this in mind, the transition from baseball to football on Sports Forgotten Heroes is also underway. And what better way to do so than with a terrific two-sports star, a guy who played parts of two years in Major League Baseball but really made his mark with a Hall of Fame career in the NFL, Ace Parker. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes, episode number 137, Ace Parker. Now, for those of you who don't know the story of Ace Parker, he was a terrific multi-sport star and wound up attending Duke University, where he played baseball and football. Back during his days, the 1930s and the 1940s, baseball was the king of sports, and that's where Ace had hoped he would land a career. However, his football talents could not be overlooked. While he starred on Duke's baseball team, he really excelled on the gridiron. In fact, he was so good for the Blue Devils that he was actually in contention for a Heisman Trophy while quarterbacking the team from 1934 through 1936. But again, it was baseball that caught his fancy. And it was baseball that he pursued when he signed with Connie Mack and the Philadelphia Athletics. Ace was a part of the 1937 and 38 athletics, but playing part-time and hitting only 179 during those two years did not speak to a long career. So, Ace also gave pro football a shot, and wow, what a difference. In 1937, Ace suited up for the NFL's version of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Yeah, that's right. There was a Brooklyn Dodgers that used to play in the NFL. And Ace immediately made an impact. In fact, over the course of his NFL career, he was named an MVP, an All-Pro, led the NFL in passing one year, and he once even co-led the NFL in interceptions. Yes, Ace played on both sides of the ball. He was a true 60-minute man. He even kicked, punted, and he returned kickoffs and punts as well. Joining me to talk about Ace is the president of the Professional Football Researchers Association, George Bozica. However, before we get into today's discussion about Ace, a few reminders. Please follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on X at Sports F Heroes. Follow on Facebook. Hey, you could even watch today's episode on YouTube. And wherever it is you are listening, please follow, rate, and review. And as always, I thank you for your support. Okay, Ace Parker. Not only did he break in with the Philadelphia Athletics in 1937, he also broke in later that same year with the NFL's Brooklyn Dodgers and wound up in the Pro Football Hall of Fame a few decades later, 1972. Earlier, in 1955, he was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. And here to tell us more about Ace Parker is my guest, George Bozica. George, welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. So glad you're aboard. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thrilled. Uh, I know you have a uh, great knowledge of football. And like I said, happy to have you here. And uh, today we're going to talk about Ace Parker. And I want to start with this. What makes him such an important figure in football history? 
Well, I, I think he's an important figure in football history because I think he was one of the best quarterbacks of the uh, late 30s and early 40s. Uh, you know, uh, Sammy Ball was one of his contemporaries at the time, and they sort of had a mutual admiration society for each other because, you know, they each sort of said that they were the best you know, player that either of them had seen. So, you know, for somebody like Sammy Ball, who I think would be on some people's Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks, sure. uh, I think that's a, a great compliment. And that seemed to be a compliment of a lot of his contemporaries. Uh, Mel Hine and others said that he was one of the best all-around players that they had seen uh, in football at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly enough, I think his decision to play football professionally was somewhat of an afterthought. His goal, if I follow the story correctly, was to be a major league baseball player. And that's sort of why I decided to do a podcast at this time of year uh, on Ace Parker because we are now transitioning from the baseball season to the football season, so I thought Ace would be a great topic. Um, why did Ace decide to give up baseball and pursue professional football? Yeah, I, you're absolutely correct. Uh, I think, you know, at that point in his life, I think that he thought baseball was going to be a sport. I mean, he was a great all-around athlete in high school, played just about everything and played it well. Uh, he was at uh, Woodrow Wilson High in Portsmouth, Virginia. You know, he then moved on to Duke, and he was a great all-around athlete there, played football, played basketball, played baseball. Uh, and his love was baseball, though, and he thought that was going to be it. But, you know, he joined up with the Philadelphia A's uh, during one of their, you know, down periods. Because as we all know, it seemed that the Philadelphia A's during the Connie Mack years were either first and World Series champions or dead last in the American League. And he got him at a time that they finished seventh, seventh out of the eight-team American League of that time. Uh, and then the next year they finished dead last. And his lifetime batting average was a uh, rather measly 179. So I think he decided rather quickly that football was a better sport for him. Although he continued his love of baseball throughout his life, and he continued to play, you know, minor league ball and manage minor league ball, and even. Uh, went on to be uh, uh, the head coach of the baseball team at Duke uh, and uh, his, you know, where he, you know, basically, uh, you know, played all of his college ball. I also um, think that from what I read, that even though he struggled in baseball and baseball was, you know, his first love and he wanted to give football a go, he thought he'd only try football for a year. You know, I'll, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I'll play a year, see what happens. Why do you think he had such, I don't know if this is the right term, a low opinion of himself as a football player um, that he didn't think of himself as a better football player and that he could actually make it in the NFL? You know, the only thing that I can sort of hypothesize is, is that he wasn't a very big guy. Uh, you know, by my modern standards, uh, you know, he was 5'10", about 168, I saw in one reference, up to about 178. So, you know, he wasn't a specimen by any means. But the thing I kept yeah, reading I, about... You know what? You know what? I take offense to that. Yeah, What's well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm that same size, so I understand. <laughs> I can joke about it. But, you know, I, I, the one thing that he had, uh, and, and I'm going to make sort of a, a Rudy comparison here, is he had, he had heart. You know, and that's what everybody said. You know, he, he originally was going to matriculate to, uh, uh, oh, God, it was, uh, it wasn't Duke, Virginia Tech. He was going to originally matriculate to Virginia Tech, but he visited Duke, and he met with Wallace Wade, who was the coach at Duke at that time. And Wallace Wade was one of the great college coaches. He'd won a number of national championships at Alabama. He then came to Duke, and he told Ace, he said, well, it's a good thing you're you're going to Virginia Tech because you want to make the team here. Mm. Well, that encouraged him to go to Duke and to prove Wallace, Wallace Wade wrong, and he did. 
and he became a huge star at Duke. Actually, he got his nickname at Duke because a, a local sports writer said that he was their ace in the hole. His given name was Clarence. So uh, that's how he got the nickname Ace. He said he was their ace in the hole. He could run. He could pass. He was a great punter. Whatever they needed, he came through. And he was so a decent. I, I think maybe there was that. And it may have just been, you know, a love for baseball over football. And that's really what he wanted to do. Right. And he played. He was a good ball player, a good yeah. baseball player in, in college. Active. Yeah. You know, the other thing I really find interesting, football, baseball, um, that he sustained his most serious injuries as a baseball player and not football. Um, how did those injuries affect his baseball days and what kind of effect did they have on his football career, if any? Well, you know, he, he made mention in an, in an interview I saw that, you know, you, you didn't, you had to play through being hurt back then. That that wasn't a factor. And I think that was the attitude he had. It was all part of that determination that made him the great player that he was, is that, you know, he played through those. And actually, you know, it said that he had to wear a brace going into the 1940 season, which turned out to be his probably greatest season. He ended up being the NFL MVP that year. And he had to play, the, play with a brace because he had injured his leg playing baseball uh, before the football season. And that was, you know, that that was what turned out to be probably his greatest years was 1940 and 1941. So uh, Brooklyn had, you know, winning records both those years after they had sort of struggled during his earlier years. And uh, Jock Sutherland, the great University of Pittsburgh coach, became their head coach at that time. And with, with Jock, he got the most out of what he had, uh, was a real, you know, disciplinarian, uh, strictly by the book. He had to do it his way. And, you know, he got a lot out of that team, including Ace. Yeah, he did get a lot of that, a, a lot out of Ace. Ace, as we said, uh, uh, started off as a Major League Baseball player. You alluded to the fact that he he wasn't all that good. I mean, his career batting average was 179. He did have two home runs, you know, uh, uh, 25 ribbies. Um Played 94 games, so it was a good sampling. Um, he decides to leave the athletics, heads over to the NFL with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now, before we get into his career with Brooklyn, I'd love, George, if you could take us back to that time and tell us a little bit about the teams in the NFL during that time, such as the Dodgers the Pirates, and, and other teams during that period and their relationships with the Major League Baseball teams by the same names in the ownership. Well, based on my research, I, I really zeroed in on the Dodgers because I wanted to find out, you know, Brooklyn Dodgers, obviously, Major League Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, really no relationship between the teams. Actually, the Brooklyn Dodgers, NFL Brooklyn Dodgers started as the Dayton Triangles, uh, which was one of the original teams when the NFL was was founded. So, uh, but uh, Bill Dwyer, a Brooklyn businessman, and John Depler, who was a player coach of the Orange Tornadoes, which is also an early NFL team, purchased in 1930 the Dayton Triangles and moved it to Brooklyn, and they played at Abbott's Field, just like the baseball Dodgers. Uh, but they also borrowed the Dodgers name. Uh, and this was interesting to me because I always knew that the Brooklyn Dodgers were named the Dollar Dodgers because that's short for trolley Dodgers. Right, right. Uh, you had to dodge the trolleys, I guess, back in the day in, in, in Brooklyn. Uh, but they were actually known during that time as the Robins based on their famous manager, Wil Wilbert uh, Robinson. Uh, so they did eventually, obviously, take the name of Dodgers that we now know. Uh, but that's where they got their name is they, they sort of, I got quote unquote, borrowed it from the baseball Dodgers who, and as I read, you know, it seemed like for Brooklyn fans, they used a lot of different names back then. You know, I mean, they, it seemed like, you know, some, some still call them the Dodgers and all that. So, yeah, so that's, so there really wasn't any, you know, tie in between the two, but they did play at Ebbets Field, uh, which I, I found very interesting. 
what kind of team were they? Tell us a little bit about that team. I, uh, you know, the Dayton Triangles becoming the Dodgers. Um, from what I read, um, they weren't exactly a great team, particularly before Ace got there. So what can you tell us about the Dodgers? Yeah. And yeah, maybe who are some of the other players on the Dodgers that we might recognize their names today? Well, Bruiser Kennard uh, played on the Dodgers. He was a teammate. Uh, uh, it was interesting to me because actually a couple of former New York Giants actually purchased the team from Dwyer and Deppler. Uh, and that was Chris Red Cagle and John Shipwreck Kelly. And you could probably do a whole episode on Shipwreck Kelly. Because I mean, when I got into him, he was an interesting person. Somebody likened him to the Broadway Joe of his day. He came, he came from a wealthy family, uh, lived on Long Island in a mansion. Uh, and he was the kind of guy that, you know, he frequented places like, you know, the old, you know, established uh, restaurants and night spots and part of that, as they said, society, you know, uh, structure in New York at that time with 21 and the Stork Club and El Morocco. He was good friends with Bing Crosby. Uh, you know, just some of the names of people, they said that, he had photographs in his mansion of him with the Duke of Windsor, uh, Onassis, Picasso, Hemingway, Clark Gable, Irving Berlin, uh, Nixon, Bob Hope. Uh, I, I mean, he's a fascinating guy. Sounds and, like he hung out at Two Chore a lot. Yeah, yeah. You know, so he, he was uh, – and he was an underground agent for the FBI during World War II, which is, which is, wow. is interesting too. So, I mean – yeah, you, you could probably do a whole episode on Shipwreck Kelly. He, I just, I, it was a, it was a side story, sort of a sidebar, but I thought this guy is, you know, really an interesting fella. And, uh, uh, you know, not a, not a bad player. He actually led the NFL in receptions, uh, and in 1933 with 22. Just to, <laughs> to show you, you know, yeah, you know, I, it was interesting. I was listening to your interview with Otto Graham, uh, about Otto Graham with Ken Crippen, and you were talking about the fact that, you know, why are players like Otto Graham or even an Ace Parker not appreciated today? And, you know, a lot of it is, is that, you know, there's a, a bias towards recent players. And there's also been all this numbers inflation and statistics inflation. And it's really hard to compare. So you have to compare players of that day with other players of that day. You know, you, you know so here's a guy that led the league with 22 receptions. Now, you know, the league lead is over 100 receptions. So it just was a different game, you know, but, but he was a... a you know, he was a good player of his time, uh, Shipwreck mm -hmm. Kelly. So, uh, yeah, yeah. actually, when Ace came to Brooklyn, he sort of felt like a country bumpkin uh, because, you know, he wasn't used to the big city and everything. And, uh, you know, he did say that he learned, though, to frequent Toot Shores, which was a famous sort of, quote, unquote, saloon in New York, where a lot of famous uh, sports figures and entertainment figures would be there. You know, on any given night, you would walk into Toots's and, you know, you'd see Frank Sinatra or Jackie Gleason or Joe DiMaggio or Frank Gifford. And he always took care of these guys so that they weren't bothered so they could go in there and have a drink, sit in the corner, and nobody would bother them because you know, that was the kind of place he ran. I remember Jackie Gleason saying one time that he had lousy food, but they liked to go there. So they liked to frequent it, even though he had lousy food. It was a good place to go drink, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so, you know. Ace did get into some of that, but going back to your original question, because I, I, I came way around there is, you know, they, they had nothing to do with the original Brooklyn Dodgers. And, and eventually um, Dan Topping, who went on to be the president and the owner of the Yankees, bought out Cagle's interest. So there was a short period of time when him and Kelly were the co-owners of the, of the Dodgers. And as a team, the Dodgers, you know, didn't fare very well until that 40 and 41 season when Jock Sutherland became their coach. And that was sort of their peak years. And, and uh, you know, not to say Ace's performance throughout all those years was, was, you know, good. You know, he was definitely Hall of Fame material, but he really, really, the team and him really blossomed under Jock Sutherland. And he got there in 1937. And he he really he did he made an immediate impact on the team quarterback tailback and like you said he was an all around player he did so much tell us about the kind of player 
that East Kelly uh, that East Parker was and just what kind of impact he did have on the Dodgers that first year. Yeah, you know, he was uh he was a great all-around player as you said. And and I think it was part and parcel of the fact that, you know, he was running, you know, the old single wing at that point. So, you know, the tailback in that situation was handling the ball most of the time because he was usually a player that could pass the ball proficiently, run proficiently, and also punt proficiently. And those were all things that, you know, Parker did well. You know, just hearing about the kind of player he was, it, it sort of reminded me of if you if you step forward into the 50s and the 60s, I thought that he reminded me of what I used, what I heard through research about, you know, the kind of player Frank Gifford was for the Giants or the kind of player that Paul Horning was for the Packers. They were guys that could do a little bit of everything and do it well. And that was what Ace was. You know, he wasn't necessarily, he said, fast, but he was quick. He was cerebral. He was very creative. And he was, they said, a great faker of the ball. And those are all things that, you know, made him a success in that offense. And he did have, you know, an immediate impact, you know, statistically and, and you know, just somebody that the team could rally around and depend on because that was just the kind of player he was. Is is there a player in today's game who you might be able to compare Ace to? And 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 here's where I'm going with that. You know, we went when Ace played, like we said, he ran the ball, he threw the ball. We went through a period where it was basically just pocket quarterbacks. Now we're getting back to, you know, quarterbacks that can do so much. Lamar Jackson. Uh, the new guy for the Commanders, Jaden Daniels, you know, even Josh Allen, and and you know quarterbacks like that, Pat Patrick Mahomes. These guys can throw the ball, they can run the ball, and I sort of think of Ace Parker in the same vein. Is 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 that a fair comparison? That he's that style of player. Maybe you can't compare him athletically. Yeah, from just how great those guys are, but right. it's the same style. Yeah, I would say he was definitely in the vein of that. I mean, when you when you asked the question, the first person that came to my mind was Lamar Jackson, because you know Lamar Jackson can also beat you with your feet. And not to say that you know some of the others that you mentioned, like Patrick Mahomes. I mean, we've seen over the last you know four or five seasons that you know Mahomes can beat you with his feet. Also, you know, he keeps the play going and he does stuff like that. Yeah, I I don't think you compare the game, and I think that's part of the problem is the game has changed so much from from what it was back then to what it is now. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's why he was proficient. And I think that's why those, you know, I think there's, I think there's obviously a direct descendant line to those players. Now, like, like we said before, he, he, he wanted to be a baseball player, really didn't succeed at it, figured, ah, you know what, I'll try football. I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll play for a year. Um, was he surprised at how well he did play? Did he ever think that he would make such an impact and make an impact like he did so quickly? You know, I I didn't see anything in the research that I did that indicated that there was any surprise. I, I think he, as I said, he just sort of came to the realization that, you know, this is uh, this is where I belong. You know, I thought it was interesting because, you know, he also mentioned that it was such a different game then because he said, you know, it was much more laid back. He said, you know, they do everything in the morning and have their afternoons off, which I thought was, you know, amazing because it's a, you know, a 24 seven game right now. And, you know, the fact that he had, he had to ask, you know, Connie Mack permission after his first year with the A's to go play football, you know, that, and, you know, he got that permission. I, I can think of some modern athletes that have played, you know, t- two sports, obviously Bo Jackson, obviously Deion Sanders, uh, uh, not so much in the football vein, but Danny Ainge, I know, played some baseball and also played for the Celtics. So, I mean, there have been some, you know, some modern athletes that have been, you know, really proficient in, in both sports. I was just really impressed when I read, you know, the kind of things that he did in high school and college, just what a great all-around athlete he was. I mean, I, I think I think that's the reason that made him a success. And, you know, one thing, you know, he, he, he batted 179, but he had a home run in his first at bat. You know, I mean, he, he – yeah, yeah, he had an auspicious start, and you would think, oh, my goodness, but, you know, sometimes that happens in baseball, you know, and then, you know, uh, so, you know, it was it was really something. And, 
And if you look at some of his numbers from his minor league play, he was a good player. He just for some reason, and maybe it was playing for the A's. I don't know. I, you know, I mean, you know, I, I can't think of a worse franchise that you could, you know, latch onto, you know, than the A's back then. You know, I mean, they've gone through their last sort of glory period, you know, in the early 30s, you know, when they had Jimmy Fox and all those guys. But then, you know, he, he got there at a time when there was, you know, some really lean years for, you know, Connie Mack. I mean, he hadn't gotten to the, you know, towards the end of his career yet, but, you know, he, you know, we all know that he probably lasted much too long because he was just stubborn about getting out of baseball. But yeah. Well, you know. well Connie Mack was that kind of a uh, manager. The A's, the Philadelphia Athletics had that kind of reputation. Heck, they had Joe Jackson, Joe Jackson. Yeah. yeah. Shoeless Joe Jackson. And um, he couldn't make it with the Athletics. And my gosh, he, he turned out to have a pretty decent career after he left that team. Yep. Um, if Ace's college days were any sort of indicator of just how good a professional football player he would be, then he certainly underestimated himself. I mean, tell us about his career, what you can about his career at Duke and the fact that he was actually a Heisman Trophy contender. He was. He finished sixth in the Heisman voting in uh, in thirty six. Uh, that year, Duke went nine and one, uh, conference champs. Uh, he had a hundred and five yard return versus North Carolina kickoff return, which is still a school record to this day. That's still a school record. Uh, and he was a consensus All American. Uh, you know, he's in the College Football Hall of Fame, and he's also in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So, yeah, I you know he may have may have underestimated because of his love of baseball and thinking that was a sport for him because, you know, he was definitely, as the local reporter said, you know, I mean, you know, I, 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 I can't remember off the top of my head. I would have had to write him down, but, you know, I, I, I checked in the Duke media guide, you know, those seasons and his name constantly, they, in their media guide, they have a breakdown of their schedule. And then they put like the key players in each game and Parker's name kept coming up game after game after game. So, yeah, he, he most definitely, you know, had, you know, a great impact. He was also team captain in 1936. So, obviously, the players around him looked up to him also. So, uh, you know, he was he was definitely the the what made that team go. So, uh, there's uh, without any question, he was a great at two. What kind of person was Ace Parker? Tell us about his life off the field and the kind of person he was. You know, from from what I read in interviews that people have done, it just sounded like he was just a really, you know, great guy. You know, I mean, that you know, he was, uh, uh, you know, in interviews that were done later in life, they said he was just a very pleasant person, answered questions, didn't sound like he had a big ego. Uh, you know, and he was that kind of person. I mean, he said the biggest thrill in his life was making it into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You know, I don't think he thought that would be something in the cards for him. So I think he was a, a humble person and, and a, and a you know, good person. So I, I think that's what I read and what I gleaned from a lot of the interviews that were done uh, with him and the kind of person he was. All right, let's talk more about his skills on the field. First, if you can, evaluate him as a quarterback. You know, he said that uh, because of his size, you know, he he didn't have the same skill necessarily of, a, say, a Sammy Ball you know, throwing the football because it was a much rounder ball back then. Uh, but, you know, he was still, you know, very proficient with those. Uh, you know, as I as I sort of said earlier, the things that made him who he was was basically that, you know, people kept saying he had a big heart. He was tough. He was versatile. Uh, he was a great all around player. Uh, I got the impression that he got the most out of what he had because of his creativity. And also the fact that, you know, he was such a good faker in those aspects. And I think, you know, if he did have some, maybe he wasn't the physical you know specimen that, say, a Sammy Ball was, he was able to overcome it because of that determination. You know, I think it's interesting, the story of with him and Duke. And, you know, when Wallace Wade sort of, you know, in a roundabout way, maybe, and maybe Wallace Wade knew what he was doing. You know, maybe he realized that, you know, he wanted this guy, but the way he had to do it was, you know, with some reverse psychology. But, you know, I mean, that's that's who he was. And I think that what he brought to the football field as a quarterback was, you know, that ability, that creativity and versatility. 
you know, as you were talking about this just now, another name popped into my head. Um, a guy who, um, if people remember, um, that that might also be a good comparison for Ace Parker when I think about physical stature and the running ability and all. Fran Tarkenton. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's another good analogy. I, I I said, I think there's a direct line through quarterbacks of that type of quarterback. And I mean, you know, I, because of, you know, I sort of came of age as a football fan during those 60s and 70s, you know, I remember Fran Targington as just, you know, doing unbelievable things with his feet. I mean, things that I've never seen other quarterbacks do, you know, Targington would, he would just keep the play alive, you know, running circles around the defense until he found an opening. Uh, and, you know, he was just that kind of player. You know, I obviously I haven't seen game film on Ace Parker to know if that's what he was doing. Everything is by, you know, people that explained what he was like on the football field. And the thing I kept hearing was what a great all around player he was. He could do it all. And he also, which we haven't even discussed, he also played defensively because, you know, this was still during that period of the 60 minute man. And, you know, he was one of those 60 minute players. Uh, actually, uh, he had seven career interceptions. Yeah, yeah, he did. So, I mean, you know, so they said he was also tenacious on defense and could play great on defense. So, you know, and that's that's something that's not even a factor in today's game. I mean, you know, uh, you know, people make a, I, I guess, a very big deal about Otani in baseball because, you know, he can do it all. He can pitch and he's also, you know, hit and everything. But you know, we don't see that in football. You know, I mean, you, you don't see guys going both ways at, at all anymore. You know, it's. You know, I, I it just it's not part of today's game. It's a, it's a game of specialization. Yeah, there's there's a gentleman I'm sure you know Chris Willis, and I want to try to get him on to talk about. He recently wrote a book called uh, 60 Minute Men," and um, that is that's a that's a part of the game that is no longer a part of the game. And Ace certainly mastered it. I mean, true 60 minutes. Not only was he on the the field as a as 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 a quarterback. He was there as a tailback, a punter, a defensive back. I mean, he did it all. So like you did for me in evaluating him as a quarterback, and by the way, his second year in the NFL at quarterback, he led the league in attempts with 148 pass attempts, and he threw for 865 yards, five touchdowns. His high came a couple years later in 1940 when he threw for 10 touchdowns talk about however his his abilities at tailback and the kind of runner he was you you sort of you sort of talked about it but i mean my gosh the guy could run with the ball too uh in 1939 he had five touchdowns um ran for over 300 yards in a season a couple of times so talk about his ability at tailback. Yeah, you know, as, as I said, that he he didn't consider himself fast. He considered himself quick, and you know, he also considered himself creative and and really good at faking. So I think that's how he overcame his size. Was uh, I keep going back to the idea that you know I think he was a very smart player, and you know got the most out of that. Uh, I didn't see a whole lot written about his defense, except for the fact of how many interceptions he had, and that, you know, and that he he played both ways. But you know, it just I think a lot of our evaluation of players from that era is is based on you know what film may be available, which isn't obviously a ton, but it's also on the recollections of other players and things that they've said. You know, I sometimes see uh, you know they said when certain players made it into the centennial class. You know, it was because, well, you know, such and such, like a George Hallis said this about them. And that seemed to carry a lot of weight, you know, back then. But I think it was pretty well, you know, from things I did read during the research that, you know, he, he was just really respected by you know, not only his teammates, but by his opponents. You know, as I said, you know, people like Mel Hine, great New York giant, uh, uh, Wellington Mara said some things, you know, uh, uh, Bruiser Kennard, his own, you know, teammate, you know, they just all were so impressed with his, you know, all around ability. And I think, you know, he brought that to everything that he did. I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but that's, you know, basically what I kept hearing was that he just had this great, 
you know, all around ability that really made him excel on the football field. Well, I think one of the things that really can speak to just how good he was is the fact that he only spent six years in the NFL or six seasons in the NFL. Um, and he still made it into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, like so many of his uh, fellow football players. He lost a good part of his career, prime years of his career, during World War II. Three full seasons, 1942, 43, 44, prime years. One can only speculate. But what do you think Ace missed? Yeah, he, he definitely did. He's, he served at the uh, Norfolk Naval Base during that time frame and actually managed their baseball team. Because, uh, you know, there was, you know, obviously service teams back then. He managed their team and also played. Uh, you know, so, but yeah, you know, I mean, you know, he lost probably, I mean, he was in his prime in 40 and 41. So you have to believe that he lost those years. Although, you know, he did come back. Uh, the Dodgers were, you know, a bit of a shambles by then. Uh, in in uh, 44, they had gone, they had changed their name to the Tigers, but as everybody said, they knew better. They were still the same old Dodgers. They finished 0-10. Uh, uh, he played for the then Boston Yanks for a season, and then he finished his career in the All-America Football Conference with the, with, with, with the football New York Yankees. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, he, you know, I, I, I always remember when I would talk to my, my dad who passed a couple of years ago, and we would talk, you know, old time baseball. And he was a huge DiMaggio fan. And he always said, I wonder what DiMaggio or Ted Williams or Bob Filler would have done if they didn't miss the years, you know, to the war. You know, he always talked about that. You know, he said he always thought, you know, DiMaggio would have probably had another hundred homers or more, you know, more RBIs and stuff. You know, and then he would also say, especially with the wartime pitch. You know, he always he always threw that in. So, you know, I got to believe that, you know, he he missed some prime years there during during his time in the service, as they all did. Yeah, let's 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 go back to the Dodgers for a moment. It's always fun to talk about uh, what the league was like back then. It's a you know slight detour from from Ace, but when he did come back, like you said, there were no more Brooklyn Dodgers. They left the borough. They moved to of all places. Boston, and of all names, they became the Yanks, not the Yankees, Yanks. Tell us, why did they leave Brooklyn, and how did they arrive at the name Yanks, again, in of all places, Boston? Yeah, what I read is that they they were the Yanks, and and apparently they played part of their games at Fenway, uh, but then they also played a game in New York, so they were like, you know, in both, you know, uh, in spots. One time I read that they were just called the Yanks, but then also, you know, the the, the quote unquote Boston Yanks. Uh, so yeah, it, it's just you know one of those unusual things back then because there wasn't the stability with the franchises back in that era of the NFL that we have you know nowadays. You know, it's it's, it's you know especially during the war, you know, rather famously, you know, because teams didn't have enough players, you know, teams had to combine their resources like the the Steelers and the Eagles and the and the Steagles and the, the, uh, <laughs> Steagles. the I, the, I the, love that name the Steagles yeah, and, the, and the and the Bears and and Pittsburgh also uh, known as the Carpets so you know that was a sort of a common thing you know during the war years because of the fact that you know uh, teams were struggling you know financially they were struggling because they didn't have enough players uh, you know a lot of times these combined teams weren't very successful but you know that was just you know part of the sort of instability of the league at times back in that time period in fact there's, there's a really interesting uh coffin corner article uh i'm i'm as you know the president of the pro football research association just to get a plug in for the organization uh, but uh and, and tell us the coffin corner is yeah, coffin a- corner is, is our is our uh, is our official magazine and there's an old archived article where there could, there could be an argument, but it, it's easily discounted, but it makes for interesting reading that you could make a direct, uh, an almost direct line from 
the Dayton Triangle to the Indianapolis Colts. But it, it, it isn't identified as such, and the league doesn't does it. But it's really it's just a fun article to read. <laughs> yeah, just like there, there's a lot of twists, there's a lot of twists and turns and all this, but it, it just it's an interesting article to read. And I guess the best way to say it, it's a fun article to read. <laughs> You could also make the argument about the Dallas Texans. Yes, yes. Original, okay. original Dallas Texans. The original Dallas Texans. That, that, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, it's, play, it's always had their right. only had their only win here in my uh, <laughs> my my town my, my town where I live right now, Akron, Ohio, at the old Akron Rubber Bowl on Thanksgiving Day. They said there were so few fans in the seats. They said the players could have gone up in the stands and shook every hand in the stands. So. Yeah, I, I've tried to find a program for that game, and it's impossible to find. It's got to be one of the rarest programs around. I'll have to turn you on to uh, uh, someone that just might be able to help you out. I did a uh, a podcast on the original Dallas Texans, and yeah. uh, a lot of fun there. Hey, yeah. get back to Ace. So he comes back from the war, goes, uh, uh, rejoins the team now they're the Boston Yanks. He didn't get a lot of playing time. It wasn't he? He didn't he didn't do all that well. So he played for the Boston Yanks, and then that was 1945. In 1946, he finally made it to the Yankees. He left the NFL for the new All America Football Conference and yes. the New York Yankees. Yes, the AAFC had a team called the New York Yankees. And he was actually pretty good again. In fact, he led New York to a record of 10-3-1, a first-place finish in the Eastern Division, threw for eight touchdowns, rushed for three. Why did he leave the NFL if he still had that kind of talent? Because the AAFC was not all that bad. There were some decent teams, some good ball players. How was he convinced to leave the NFL and go to the AAFC. You know, from what I read, they said they sort of let him retire. I think he wanted to move on at that point. I think, you know, he had been injury prone, uh, you know, with uh, mostly the baseball career. And I think he was just, you know, ready to uh, to, to finish his career at that point. Uh, you know, I, I it's interesting. They, they obviously lost to the Browns because the Browns won every AAFC title. But that was a, that was a pretty good Yankees team. They, they gave the Browns everything they wanted in the two championship games that they played. And that year they, they lost to the Browns 14 to nine, but it was actually a lot of former Brooklyn Dodgers players, a lot of the better players that were on that Yankees team that, that topping, you know, was able to bring with him there. And, uh, you know, Ace was one of those guys, you know, and, uh, you know, the, he did have that one sort of uh, last hurrah getting into the only, only championship game he played as a professional because, uh, you know, his nemesis was usually Sammy Ball. Uh, and you know they always they always seem to get beat out by by them in those good years that they did have. Well, I was really interested in the fact that he did have a good season with the Yankees in 1946, and you know, like we said, led them into the championship game against the the, the Cleveland Browns, and they were just a powerhouse, an absolute powerhouse, and they proved that time and again, even when they entered the NFL a couple of years later. So what I don't understand is though the Dodgers or the Yanks, let him go retire. He goes, he plays for the Yankees in the AAFC as a decent season. Yeah. And then he decides to hang it up. Yeah, Why not go on? It's not like he was 38, 39, 40 years old. He was still 34 or 35 years old. Yeah. Why not go yeah. on? Yeah, I I think that's one of those mysteries. I mean, I know that, you know, obviously his love of baseball because, I mean, you know, after that, you know, he, he did manage at the minor league level. He managed at Duke. He also was an assistant football coach at Duke, too, during that time frame. So, uh, you know, he I kept reading it. He always had that love for baseball, and maybe it was just a matter of wanting to move on with that part of his life at that point. Interesting. Yeah, after his playing days were over, he returned to the game he loved, baseball. He actually coached in college at Duke and in the minor leagues. Can you tell us anything more about his days as a baseball manager? I think he even got one of the minor leagues a manager of the year award. Right. Uh, why did he? Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, I read that he was manager of the year uh, twice, I think, in the Piedmont League. Uh, uh, actually managed the Durham Bulls uh, at one time, you know, so uh, uh, one of the more famous minor league teams, obviously. Uh, but, yeah, he, uh, he – I, I, I think the thing that interested me so much was how much time he spent managing. You know, I, I, I just was really impressed when I heard that. Uh, you know, I knew he was obviously a solid baseball player, even though he didn't have a lot of success, you know, in the big show. But, I mean, he, he was obviously a solid player. But I was just really interested because, you know, he seemed to be doing the managing thing, you know, fairly early on. You know, so, uh, you know, it, it just – I guess it just told me by association that he must have been a smart guy, must have known the game. And, you know, he was just, a, you know, a good leader in that regard. And maybe that's another reason why – he was as good as he was on the football field too, was that leadership ability. Because, you know, I, I was just impressed with the fact, you know, because a lot of times afterwards you hear about, I mean, he was doing it on an ongoing basis on and off where I read that he was managing teams and also playing for teams. So uh, I, I was sort of impressed with that and, and actually sort of surprised that he was doing that as early as he was. Mm -hmm. If there is one thing about Ace Parker that I have not asked you about that you think is important for us to know, what would that be? You know, I think we've pretty much covered everything. Uh, you know, he did spend some time also as an NFL scout, uh, which I also thought was interesting. In addition to his, his coaching and managing, you know, he did do that. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, you asked a question earlier about what kind of person he was, and by all accounts, you know, he was just a, a really good and, and pleasant person, uh, humble, and I, I, you know, I think that's the thing that was sort of impressive with me, you know, you, especially when you consider not all players, but, you know, some of our modern players, you know, uh, have quite an ego sometimes, and uh, that, I, from what I read, that wasn't who an Ace Parker was. He wasn't that kind of a player, uh, but that it was a different time. It was a simpler time, I guess is the best way to put it. You know, when it, when he said that, you know, it wasn't like, you know, today, by the way, this is an interesting fact. He, he, he died as the oldest living hall of famer. Yes. So, which is, I think is interesting. He was the oldest living hall of famer when he passed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's an interesting sort of tidbit about him. He lived a, he lived a long and full life. He sure did. Well, speaking of the Hall of Fame, he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1972. Now, many times I speak with guests about forgotten stars, whether it be in baseball or football or hockey, whatever it is, who we think should be in the Hall of Fame but are not. He's played, as we said, in the NFL for six seasons, the AAFC for one season. His stats do not blow you away. What makes him a Hall of Famer? I'm not doubting the fact that he deserves to be in Canton. I would never doubt that. But what makes him a Hall of Famer? I, I think it's the fact that, you know, the success he had during that time frame. And I think, as I said, the testimonials of other players, that he was one of the finest all around players of that era, uh, you know, with, you know, Sammy Ball and some of the others that I think that just the fact that he was considered such an excellent player. And, you know, I believe he was, you know, as you said, his, his career was shortened also by the Warriors, which I think is sometimes, you know, taken into consideration, but yeah, yeah. Look, looking at it, his numbers don't blow you away. Uh, but I, I don't see anybody that, you know, every year you see people that say, well, that person doesn't belong in Hall of Fame or that person doesn't belong. I, I, I've not heard that about Ace Parker. I, I never hear him in those conversations. I hear other names, but he's not one that I hear. So, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I think sometimes even that, I personal feeling, I think that does a disservice to some players too. You know, uh, you, know you, you always hear certain arguments about certain players. I've, I've heard that argument about Floyd Little. Well, you know, he didn't have the numbers. I, I hear it a lot about Joe Namath, which angers me because, I, Joe was my favorite player growing up, and I felt that he fully deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. I think there's more to Joe Namath than the number of interceptions he threw. You know, he was he, there was a time period when every publication when I was a kid said there was no better quarterback in the NFL during that period. And you know, I, I think people sometimes again, and and I understand the arguments. It's not that I don't understand them, but I, I just sometimes think 
it does a disservice to some players that are in the Hall of Fame when people say, well, he doesn't deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. I, I just think that's a disservice. Well, one of the cool things about the PFRA, the Professional Football Researchers Association, which you know you are the president of, is the Hall of Very Good. So yeah. let's let's talk about two things here. A, yeah. tell me a little bit more about the PFRA, its mission, and and how people can join. And two, tell us about the Hall of Very Good and what that is. Yeah. Um... If people want to, first of all, we have been in existence for uh, 40 years. Uh, we're going to actually have our uh, 50th anniversary in uh, about four or five years here. One of our goals right now, too, is to, to reach 1,000 members by our 50th. Uh, it's a little goal that we have uh, to reach 1,000 members. But uh, you can go on our website. Uh, all you have to do is Google Professional Football Researchers Association or simply PFRA. And it will take you to our website, uh, and we have a spot on the website where you can join. It's uh, thirty-five dollars a year if you live in the United States, uh, forty in Canada, and then we also have an overseas rate. Uh, I think it's the best money you'll spend if you're a football history fan or buff. Uh, you know, a lot of our members are, uh, you know, obviously researchers, authors, uh, writers, and just some that are just, you know, as I said, history buffs. Uh, part of the membership is you get our Coffin Corner magazine, you know, six times a year. Uh, we have a convention, a national convention every other year. Uh, we've just announced that our national convention in uh, 25 will be in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, in years past, we try to have our conventions in uh, NFL cities. We were in Pittsburgh last year. We've also been to uh, Canton, Cleveland, Green Bay, Buffalo, New York, uh, so we've been uh, in a number of cities, and it's usually a full weekend with speakers, former players, uh, and add-on activities that include, you know, tours of uh, football-related things in the areas, whether it's museums, stadiums, and all that. So it's it's I you know it's a I can't say enough about it. You know, our our goal is to preserve the history of the game through you know through research and then disseminate that history and accurate you know telling of the game. Uh, and uh, as you said, one of our uh, projects is a Hall of Very Good, where every year we go through a nominating and voting process to name players to our Hall of Very Good, which are players that have not been named to the Hall of Fame, but we feel are deserving of recognition. And we normally uh, induct anywhere from eight to 10 players a year. Uh, and we've done that since I believe 2002. Uh, and uh, a number of the players that we've named to our Hall of Very Good have, have ultimately been elected to the Hall of Fame, which is always a pleasant thing to see because it's sometimes pleasant to see those guys that have, you know, fallen through the cracks finally get their recognition. Uh, so and we're, we're proud of that. But yeah, that's what the Hall of Very Good is. And it's, it's member centric because members can make the nominations and then uh, the committee, you know, whittles down the list to uh, 20, uh, which we actually are just in the process of doing for this year's class. And the voting will be uh, starting on that uh, soon here. Awesome. Well, George, thank you so much for telling us a little bit more about the PFRA, the Hall of Very Good, and for sharing so much about Ace Parker. Truly appreciate you taking time out of your evening to join me here on Sports Forgotten Heroes. Really, uh, really want to thank you a whole lot. Thank you, Warren. Thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Anytime. Over the course of his career, Ace Parker was named NFL MVP in 1940. He was first-team All-Pro in 1938 and 1940, second-team All-Pro in 1937 and 1939, and in the AAFC, he was named a second-team All-Pro during his only season in the AAFC with the New York Yankees, and that was 1946. In addition to his inductions into the Pro and College Football Halls of Fame, Ace was also inducted into the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame, the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, and the Duke University Sports Hall of Fame. And while he excelled on the football field, his first love was baseball. And after his playing days were over, he returned to Duke, where he coached the baseball team from 1953 through 1966. Hey, if you're interested in joining the Professional Football Researchers Association, 
an organization which I'm a member of and I truly enjoy, please check it out at www.profootballresearchers.com. That's www.profootballresearchers.com. Thanks again to George for being here, and thanks to all of you for listening, and I'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.